Have you heard of Renewed in God's Love? In this lesson, we will learn that the Lord thy God is in the midst and is mighty. He will say he will rejoice over us with joy. Happy Sunday. Are you missing your Sunday school? Would you like to be a part of our Sunday school? Then subscribe. Like, comment, and ring the bell to be notified every time I post a new video on our Sunday School lesson. Hi, I'm Regina Dean Reed, and I teach Sunday School at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Maple, Mississippi. Now, let's get into this lesson. Today's lesson is Renewed in God's Love. Devotional reading is 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verses 12 through 21. Background scripture is Zephaniah, the 3rd chapter, verses 14 through 20. And our key verse is Zephaniah, the 3rd chapter, verse 17a. Today's date is June 25th, 2023. Let's start with a prayer. Almighty God, we are thankful for the people who taught us about you. We are grateful for their examples of faithfulness and for the faith of others through the centuries. Today, we rededicate ourselves to be faithful until the end, the end of our lives or the end when Jesus comes to gather his people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And our lesson aims, one, is to identify a reason for joy. Two, contrast a reason for joy with a reason for sorrow. And three, Sing a hymn of praise, chorus that reflects the text mandated to do so. Lesson introduction. A task that no one wants to do is to notify the next of kin that a loved one died in a traffic crash or a similar incident. A veteran of 30 plus years in law enforcement said that this was the worst part of his work. These situations are especially stressful when there are multiple deaths. Old Testament prophets also had the unwelcome task of bringing bad news. The task involved not news of death that had happened, but deaths that were to come. The reactions to the prophecies differ. At one extreme was wholesale repentance, found in Jonah, third chapter, fifth through the ninth verse. Much more common was the other extreme of rejection of the message and persecution of the prophet. This is found in Jeremiah, the 38th chapter, verses 1 through 6. Zephaniah was a prophet like others in bringing news, both good and bad. How he was treated is unknown to us, but his prophecies bear study yet today. Lesson context. The instructor of a class for the minor prophets presented an imaginary conversation in heaven. A person had recently arrived there, and one of the first persons he met introduced himself as Zephaniah. The new arrival was thrilled, for he assumed that this was the prophet who wrote the book, by that name. So he asked his new friend if he had indeed written that book. The individual replied that he had, and then he asked the new arrival in heaven what he thought of the little book of only three chapters. One of the students in the class reflected on that scenario and decided to write a term paper that would feature some aspects of the book of Zephaniah, just in case. The prophet is identified as Zephaniah 1 and 1, in terms of the name of his father. That was a normal way to identify a person more specifically, but that designation is part of a listing found in no other writing prophet. The four generations of those who came before Zephaniah, the fourth one is Hezekiah, given as Hezekiah in the King James Version, the same name as one of the good kings of Judah, who reigned about 727 through 699 B.C., found in 2 Kings, 18th chapter. The information given by Zephaniah causes many to conclude that he is referring to that king. That is a conjecture, but it is usually understood that there is no reason to list the name unless it refers to that king, who reigned about 100 years earlier. Zephaniah was therefore a great-great-grandson of Hezekiah. The prophet rebuked members of the royal family, this is found in Zephaniah, the first chapter, the eighth verse. And it has been suggested that his being a royal blood gave him more grounds to condemn his cousins, found in Zephaniah 1 and 1. Also features the name of good king, King Josiah, 
during those reigns from 640 to 609 B.C. Zephaniah prophesies the flagrant iniquity that is condemned throughout most of the book seems to indicate that the reforms of Josiah had not yet taken place. The revival began after the book of the law was found in 622 B.C. by Hilkiah the priest while doing repairs to the temple. Second, Second Chronicles 34th chapter verses 8 to 15. A possible time of the book of Zephaniah is therefore in the late 620s B.C. Judgment, punishment, and hope are three topics frequently found in the writings of the prophet. Judgment indicates that God had compared his announced expectations with the obedience of the people, nation, or nations being considered. Punishment is pronounced on those found guilty. Hope often follows when the punishment has accomplished its purpose. All three topics are present in the book of Zephaniah. The prophet is primarily concerned with Judah's continued rebellion against God. This is found in 2 Kings 22nd chapter verses 1 through the 23rd chapter verse 28. The first two chapters of the book of Zephaniah describes a coming day of the Lord in which Judah is to face judgment and punishment for idolatry. The punishment promised was to be a tool of God for purifying his people. The prophecy presents us with a sharp change of theme beginning in Zephaniah the third chapter the ninth verse where restoration of a remnant takes center stage. Today's study reviews the final verses of Zephaniah where a hopeful theme resounds. Lesson scriptures. Zephaniah the third chapter verses 14 through 20. Verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Future rejoicing with all the heart was to have an entirely different basis as a response to the fulfilled promises of the Lord. God's people were not forgotten, and times of joy and happiness lay ahead. Indeed, when the first wave of returnees from Babylon laid the foundations for the second, temp the second temple, their rejoicing was heard far away. Verse 15. The Lord had taken away thy judgment. He has cast out thy enemies. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. Here begins a listing of four reasons why the people were to sing, shout, and rejoice. First, the prophesied day of the Lord and its attendant judgments would be a thing of the past. Second, God will defeat, cast out, the enemy, Babylon, thus ending the oppression Judah was yet to face. We come to the third and most important of the four reasons for rejoicing. The Lord, the real king of Israel, will be with the people. So when Zephaniah described God as a king present in the midst of his people, the prophet is telling a powerful story of God's protective rule. Zechariah, this is found in Zechariah, the ninth chapter, in the eighth to the ninth verse. The text thus serves to provide encouragement for those who would be oppressed in the still future Babylon, Chaldean exile. When God is with his people, there is no room for evil. And that is the fourth reason for rejoicing. God was promising through Zephaniah to step into the situation in a new way. Although the nation of Judah as a whole had disobeyed and turned its back on God, he would not abandon the faithful remnant among his covenant people. Verse 16. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou now, and to Zion, let not thy hands be slack. When burdens are lifted, some people become cautious about moving forward, just in case another blow is coming. God's people as a nation had experienced much suffering throughout their history. Here, however, a blessed assurance is repeated in different words, and Jerusalem, synonymous with Zion, is exhorted, again, to be confident and move ahead. It is time to be busy in the Lord's work. Caution can be wise, but too much caution results in accomplishing nothing. Verse 17. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. 
He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. The image Zephaniah paints is that of a victorious king having defeated the enemy. God's entire focus shifts to his utter joy over once again being with his people, providing and caring for them. This is found in Isaiah, the 62nd chapter, verse 4. The phrase, he will rest in his love, may seem curious at first. It should be understood as God shifting from a mode of active wrath to one of steady love. Verse 18. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. This verse presents some translation difficulties. Taken as a whole, however, the verse suggests that the solemn assembly that was instituted, whether part of an annual festival or a Sabbath observance, as an expression of faith, either had or was to become a matter of shame instead. Another possibility is that because God calls the people to rejoice, he will remove those who choose to continue to wallow in sorrow. They will not be allowed to prevent others from expressing their joy. Shame and honor in the time of the ancient Near East were more than simply matters of hurt feelings. Rather, those concepts spoke to how people identified and valued themselves. To be cast into exile would result in the Judean no longer understanding who they were as a people. Verse 19. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee. I will save her that halted and gather her that was driven out. I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. Judah will no longer be known as the people who abandoned their God, but the Babylonians will have done to the people of God will become their own fate also. In the ancient Near East, physical disabilities often were considered evidence of a deity's judgment. This is found in John the ninth chapter and the second verse. The older English word halted refers to a handicap related to walking, similarly enslaved by a hostile nation, was thought to prove the inability of both king and deity to protect a people. This is found in Isaiah, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Restored relationships with God removes and heals these purported signs of abandonment. Physical healing, freedom, and return home are con concrete ways God's justice and love will be announced. Verse 20. At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth. When I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. The book of Zephaniah ends in a positive way. This is a vivid contrast to the first chapters of the book, which provides both a scathing denunciation and the promise of punishment. As Zephaniah again referred to that time, he re reinforced the link between the promises, God's restoration of familiar relationships, goes hand in hand with restoring a sense of identity as God's covenant people. The phrase, when I turn back, your captivity reemphasizes that the terrible judgment of the day of the Lord were yet to occur from the perspective of the original reader. And our questions for today, what spiritual practices do you lean into when you need to overcome fear or anxiety? Number two, in what ways are you already experiencing the now of restoration in your relationship with God? And three, what prevents you from joining in God's joy over his people? Conclusion. Fulfilled prophecies is partly intended to validate a prophet and his message. In the Bible, however, quite often the original recipients of a prophecy did not live to see the fulfillment. That is the situation with the prophecies in today's lesson. The original recipients of the message lived in the time of Josiah. This is found in Zephaniah, the first chapter and the first verse. He was slain in battle about 609 BC. The destruction of the temple did not take place until 586 BC. And the return from exile did not begin until 538 BC. So the people who first heard the prophecy did not understand the significance of what was being promised. Later, the people in captivity in Babylon did understand and 
they are described as weeping when they remembered Zion. This is Psalms 37 and 1. The return of the captives from Babylon was a rare event in history. What happened to them was noticed by other nations. Almost 50,000 people were so sincere in their faith that they made the four-month trip back to the land God had promised to their forefathers. The people who returned were never seriously tempted again by idolatry. The Babylonian captivity was not pleasant, but it had positive, long-lasting results. People finally learned that God meant what he said in the first of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is Exodus the 20th chapter and the third verse. Today's study is therefore a lesson about hope. And this hope is backed by the assurance of God himself. Jesus promised that he would come again and he added that the time is unknown. This is found in Matthew the 24th chapter verses 36 and verse 44. Almost 2,000 years have passed since Jesus made those statements. He then added that the important thing is to be ready. God keeps his word, so be ready. Thought to remember, resolve to stand on the promises of God today and all. And if you have enjoyed this lesson, give us a thumbs up. Share this lesson. Get into a Bible study group, whether it's in person or online. Get your shots. Stay six feet apart. Love each other, pray for each other, and I will see you all next week.